Hello, everyone, and welcome to episode 40 of the Ask Historians podcast. So today we are continuing our discussion with Stefan Bernardito on the, uh, on the uh, Ask Historian subreddit about the Algerian War and counterinsurgency as, as kind of a, a, the backdrop of that. We left off on the last episode just following the Philipville massacre, and uh, we're going to pick up from there with me asking about uh, the response and reaction to that in France. But as we go through this episode, I want you to kind of keep in mind something that Bernardino actually says later on, which is you can't win a counterinsurgency by killing people. Uh, and another thing that I say that this seems to be one of the worst managed wars on both sides by both groups, uh, by all the groups involved, really. Uh, it, it's really, it's a fascinating example of not just kind of the, uh, of how the use of torture and collective reprisals can backfire on someone, but also just how really when it comes down to it, a kind of collective flailing about with no real strategy can become the official strategy for years at a time. So uh, with that dire pronouncement uh, <laughs> put forth, uh, let's go ahead and return to the podcast. Again, we're going to pick up right after the Philadelphia Massacre. Welcome to the Ask Historians podcast. How was how I mean how was this uh, this Philville massacre taken back in back in Paris? I guess you could say back in the rest of France at this point. It was seen very very terrible. Of course, it was seen as something that reprehensible. Of course, because you know seventy one Europeans were left dead. You know the accounts of these. People, the, the the their bodies found mutilated. It was it made for very terrible and ghastly reading, and for and for for it being so close because you know it was just Algeria. It was it was part of France. Yeah, so I mean, is there there's widespread support then for I guess you could say more more repressive tactics in Algeria then. I I wouldn't say that uh, it was amongst the people because that might not be completely correct, but. We have to understand that the idea of uh, Algérie Française, French Algeria, was something that was supported by every political party, essentially almost every, like almost every political party in France. I mean, it was supported by socialists, by even by communists supported it. So the war still had support amongst the political parties, but the the French population was yet not completely turned towards the war as it would become later on. So what are what are the next steps then? I mean, what do the French do to, in in terms of direct retaliation for this? I mean, what are the what are the next steps for the FLN? What happens is that the war simply it goes on. Um, I, I like to take this moment to speak about the nature of warfare, actually, because so in 1956 we see 1956 and and uh, French ha, France has a new government there in in Guimolet. He's a socialist. He's a pacifist. Yet, in his own words, the government will fight. France will fight to remain in Algeria and she will remain there. There is no future for Algeria without France. His plan is uh, ceasefire, elections, negotiations. That is, there will be no negotiations until the FLN lay down their arms. Of course, this is completely unacceptable for the, for the insurgents, uh, obviously. But there was a widespread misunderstanding of what the Algerians really wanted. For example, the the new general governor of um, of Algeria, Lacoste, says, "Why would Algerians want independence when France could offer very better living standards than, say, Egypt?" This was sort of the attitudes that were going around at the time in a political level. Uh, but more importantly, under Guy Mollet, is that he actually recalls reservists and he starts sending in conscripts. Now, you couldn't do this in Indochina, but you could definitely do this in Algeria, which is part of France. And this starts to directly uh, imp- have a direct impact on the home front, on the people back home, because they have their their husbands or their, their sons being sent to Algeria and um, and being killed or suffering tremendously. For example, just to give an example, in 1956, uh, on 18 of May in the Palestra Gorge, 21 young reservists, uh, all from Paris, are killed in an ambush and all of their bodies are mutilated. 
of course, naturally, you know, you'd imagine that this would, of course, uh, cause anger, which it does, but it also causes protest because people do not want to send young men to their death in Algeria. How widespread was this, uh, was this, you know, this draft, to say it, uh, the conscription? What are the troop levels we're seeing moving into Algeria from France? Well, military force in Algeria increases from uh, 200,000 in 1956 to 400,000 in the same in the same sort of that period of time. So we have a, a, a huge surge of numbers of soldiers come entering the country. That leads us to the nature of warfare. We've been talking about um, you know local attacks and collective reprisals and all sorts of things, but we we don't really know who is actually fighting in in on the French side. So the the French soldiers were essentially divided into two categories. The intervention troops, which were the elite mobile troops, uh, paratroopers, French Foreign Legion, so units like that, who were sent out in search and destroy missions. They were highly mobile. They were highly trained. They were all you know, equipped with modern weaponry, with transports, with radios. They had experience. Many had actually come from into China. So they had actually fought against insurgents before. They were sort of the men who really did the fighting, so to say, during this war. These were the man, men who tracked down the insurgents and, and either captured or killed them. Then there's also the concept of quadrillage, essentially squaring. That leads us to the second category of troops, the sector troops. These were reservists, these were conscripts. They were put into, like we mentioned before, forward operation bases, sort of static positions that were like in the distant post, some, somewhere in like close to city, somewhere in the mountains, all over the place. And they were, uh, they were stuck there for two years. Their static position was needed because the more mobile nature of the intervention troops meant that they were always on the run, but they also had to, the insurgents had to be fixed somewhere. And that was sort of the, the, uh, the reason for these static positions. The, the whole of Algeria was sort of put into squares, thus the name squaring. So they were put in the squares, they had this one post, and this post was responsible for their own square. That meant that if uh, a group of insurgents crossed from one square to the other, the soldiers in one of the square could not follow and cross to the other square. Which doesn't seem like the most effective way of pursuing a counterinsurgency strategy, I guess you could say. Absolutely not. It was completely, uh, had no quarter, you know, it, was no, it wasn't coordinated. It wasn't, it, it lacked that sort of... Uh, uh, constant hunt, sort of constant uh, repression and sort of constant vigilance that the, the insurgents should feel, that should always feel like they were hunted. So do, I mean, do we see the, the FLN and, you know, these other, these other groups, of course, that there are other, you know, rivals and I guess sometimes allies with them. I mean, do we see a lot of these kind of tactics that are exploiting this weakness of uh, attacking one area, then quickly retreating back into another square? Now that would make absolute sense, <laughs> but just like the the, the French uh, strategy, the FLN strategy is also flawed. The Algeria in in the in the FLN strategy is ba is uh, divided into six uh, vilayas, which are autonomous political uh, political military commands. Now I want to emphasize the word autonomous here because local conditions varied, which meant that there was no it was completely uncoordinated. It, the command was decentralized, which meant that there was no real overall strategy. For example, the training of troops could be different from uh, one vilaya from the other, or the mobilization or the taxation of the local population could be different. Even the, the recruitment of women was varied between the different vilaya. Uh, officially, recru recruitment of women was uh, not allowed, because according to the Algerian uh, uh, the FLN ideology or other views on women, they were supposed to be at home, you know, taking care of, you know, the babies and cooking and what, whatnot. Not a lot of women wanted to do that. Instead, they wanted to fight. And they did. Women did fight in this war. This did not mean that they were always welcomed. And that's the thing, that they were welcomed in some villages and other villages they were not. And that is also worth remembering. Uh, but there was also a lot of infighting amongst the ALN themselves. You know, there were rivalries, political rivalries, military commanders rivalries. They were fighting amongst themselves. And here's the strangest part of it all. The French did not notice. They did not take advantage of this. 
So we have the world's worst run war on both sides, but I mean, what are I mean, what are the actual tactics that the that the FLN are using? Are they are they doing these you know smaller scale insurgency attacks, or are they are these attacks with you know artillery and you know tanks and such? Because um, of course the uh, the Vietnamese forces had China supplying. Them. Who is supplying the FLN, if if anyone? After 1956, two countries get their independence. What was once French Morocco and Tunisia. Through these two countries, they are able to create bases and they get supplies. These supplies are are smuggled either from uh, sources in France or from direct purchases in Czechoslovakia and so on. So the weapon is there. But the weaponry is not, there's, we're not talking artillery, there's no tanks, there's really no vehicles to, be, to talk about. There's only small arms, that is rifles and submachine guns, but the sort of um, quality of the weapons, they, I mean, they're good, but they're not exactly, I mean, they're not AK-47, so to say, no. We're talking about weapons that uh, some of these soldiers might even have faced during World War II. We're talking about MG-42s, MP-40s. M1 Garands, um, weapons that dated back from World War II that had ended up in uh, in the hidden uh, weapon caches in in Algeria after the 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 Amer- you know the invasion of uh, in Operation Torch in 1942 and and other supplies that they get from Czechoslovakia and, and so on. So the the Algerians weren't exactly well armed. I wouldn't. I'm not gonna say that they were well equipped. I'd, I'd actually say that. The Algerians were almost the the best example I can think of of a ragtag guerrilla force. Really, they they fought with classical guerrilla tactics. You know, ambushes, hit and runs, and uh, later on, uh, urban guerrilla warfare, which we'll touch upon later. But we have to remember what these attacks led to. I think that's the most important because that's really turned the people against the French. Let's start with. For example, false deportations. If if they find a let's say they find a mutilated body of a French soldier nearby a village, the village will then be emptied on people. They will be uh, de- deported, and the village will be burned down. In what was like what I mentioned before, collective responsibility. An estimation is that around two million out of seven million Algerians were moved internally. Uh, some of them agreed to it, but mostly it was forceful. Which seems like a good way to um, basically spark more recruitment for groups like the FLN. Absolutely, because you have um, executions, of course, because uh, that is sort of like reprisals against local attacks. Reprisal, that's the word we should all remember, because I'm, 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 uh, I'm going to emphasize that. Reprisals was a huge part of what went wrong in, in, in Algeria for the French. They kept executing, they kept burning down villages to the extent that even the soldiers themselves, even the professional soldiers themselves, became self-aware of what they were doing. To, to, to use an example, a corporal from the Foreign Legion was quoted as saying that if one day there was a new Nuremberg trial, we will all be guilty, or at those, we are, we are carrying them out every day. And he is uh, referring to the massacre at Orador Soglan in, in, on June 10th, 1944, uh, by the second uh, SS Panzer Division Das Reich, in which uh, the whole village was uh, essentially annihilated and 643 civilians killed. So we have French soldiers themselves, I mean, even right there, just comparing themselves to Nazis. Uh, how is, I mean, is, is the war still being, you know, there, of course you, you've said that there is no, there is no France without Algeria, there's no Algeria without France, but do we, do we start to get um, feelings that maybe the, the strategy isn't working back with the leaders of both the military or even politically? Not at all, actually, because throughout this time, and this, this might be, once again, more su- surprising to those more used to uh, conventional warfare, but the French doesn't lose. I mean, sure, I mean, of course, it, it suffers local setbacks, but it, the insurgents are not strong enough to really be able to hold their ground. They lose, and they lose big. And we're going we're gonna to go back to the, the, the big losses later on, but 
there is no sense of uh, like a Tet offensive where uh, where suddenly the insurgents are you know are stronger than than any you know than they than they seem before. No, nothing. They they are always on the on the weak side, and uh, the French are always very confident about their ability. Yeah, uh, it sounds like there's been basically, uh, you know, for for the past couple of years, then there's just been this low level warfare going on. You know, ambushes here, attacks here. You know, followed up with, um, you know, collective punishment, a massacre here. You know, things like that. You know, when when do we really start to see this escalating into like major battles, if if we do at all? We, I think the big the big year is is coming up pretty soon after because we're talking about 1956 right now. We're talking about Sort of the mid, like the middle of the of the of the war, and uh, the war was still characterized the the hunting down of the insurgents, hunting down these local bands. Uh, for the FLN, this means that they also have to gain control of the people, and not all people wants to support the FLN. Some wants to support the MNA, which is the other rival group, which I mentioned before. Take uh, the village of uh, Melusa, for example. 300 villagers, German villagers, are killed, are killed by the FLN because they refuse to support the, the insurgency. At the same time, other Muslims are turning towards the French because, I mentioned before, Sostel introduced the concept of the SIS, the Sections Administrative Specialisé, which is a civic action unit. And this was a unit consisting of... Uh, French government officials and nurses, local auxiliaries that worked as bodyguards, and they went from village to village providing medical help, practical help, uh, help with uh, in education, in agricultural, in in, in uh, construction, everything a village, an impoverished village might need, and these. The, these units, the SIS units, were incredibly popular, very, very popular. They were so popular that they were the prime target of the FLN. So, I mean, would you have cases where the these SAS units would go in uh, to you know, do what they need to do, win the hearts and minds, I guess you could say? Yes. Uh, they would then be attacked by the FLN, and then there would be collective punishment on the village that the SAS had originally gone in to help? Absolutely. Like you, you see that it's, it's a spiral of violence. That is something that we shouldn't forget that you cannot win a counterinsurgency conflict if you, if, if you keep killing people. That, sounds, that doesn't sound completely right, but if you kill, keep killing innocent people, if you keep repressing them, if you keep burning down their villages, if you keep forcefully deporting them, if you don't give them a choice, then you will turn them against, uh, you know, against you. This leads us to the topic of torture, which is perhaps the most enduring concept that has come out of the Algerian war. The, the torture and the, the sending in, the, the sending of conscripts into Algeria was what turned the war against them, against the French on a both social and political level. Torture was widespread throughout the conflict. Torture was used to gain intelligence from suspected uh, insurgents, not all of them guilty, of course. And uh, that was very quick to lead them against the French because that turned more and more of the population ag at, you know, against the French. But I think it's time that we do speak about the battles. The two... I would almost say they, they they weren't battles per se, but they was they they are still named as well uh, as battles. So I think they're worth mentioning. The first battle is the infamous Battle of Algiers, and this is the this is the now, capital city. Yes, that is the capital city. Now the the battle officially starts in January 1957, but it its prelude starts in on. September 30th, 1956. A young group of uh, Algerian women plant bombs in uh, different locations in, uh, Alger in Algiers. Sora Dri, for example, she uh, places a bomb in a milk bar, very often attended by children and mothers. 
while uh, Samuel Lactari uh, sets a bomb at uh, a cafe on the Rue Michelet. Yeah, so these, these were not these were not military targets then. These these were specifically to you know acts of I guess we would you know, acts of terrorism, acts of intimidation. Absolutely, this was very much a campaign of terror. Three people were killed, all civilians. Fifty were wounded. Many had to amputate, you know, a limb or or several limbs, and you know, most of most of them that actually had to amputate were children. And one of the FLN military leaders, uh, Aban uh, Ramdane, responded to the moral objection from the French, because obviously they were very upset because of this. And Ramdan responds that there was no difference between a girl who places a bomb in a milk bar and the French pilot who bombs a mehta, a, a Muslim village. But FLN members were still executed by the French government. And uh, they were executed in Algiers by um, Galliotine. And this upset the FLN uh, leadership. So they decided to carry out a bombing campaign, essentially a campaign of terror in Algiers. So it's again uh, this, this idea of retaliation, uh, escalating retaliation. You know, we have this, these initial bombs, reprisals, and then the reprisals against the reprisals. Absolutely. And it was... Uh, it was also devised to sort of gain international attention. Algiers, of course, was the the uh, the center of uh, France's military and political power. Uh, it made absolute sense to take the war to the to the urban to, to the urban, you know, to the to the cities. And uh, there were also an impending uh, United Nations vote on Algeria, and there was also the mastermind behind the Battle of Algiers was a man named Yasef Sadi. He was the man essentially responsible for everything about the coordinations, about the st- or, or the cells that these men were going to work in because they were, their headquarters of the FLN was going to have to be in the Caspa of the Algiers, which is this, um, you could almost call it like, not city block, but it's called city area, sort of called, in, in the Algiers, which was filled with secret passages and safe houses and and Joseph Sadi entered the, the Caspa. He removed all criminal elements. He removed all MA members. And he essentially turned the Caspa into a Eflin fortress filled with the hidden bomb making factories, for example. And this is all being done clandestinely. You know, this isn't this isn't an open occupation. No, absolutely not. He masterminds all of these bombs that for the next few months actually between january and october are gonna hit algiers pretty hard and they're gonna bomb uh, casinos they're gonna bomb uh, you know discos they're gonna m- bomb milk bars they're gonna m- bomb uh, shops and they're gonna assassinate police officers politicians they're gonna essentially they're gonna hit the french pretty hard and the settlers even more so Particularly, I mean, it seems like these you know, these symbols of 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 uh, not just like French colonialism, but like you know, symbols of of being French, essentially. Yes, exactly, and I mean, it, it makes it even worse by the fact that, like I mentioned, Algiers is the center of France's military and political power. So while the FLN might not be that, you know, they they, they might not have a military strength out on the countryside, on the rural areas, but they could still show themselves that we are capable of doing this to your people essentially that we are we can go into your cities we can bomb and you can you can do nothing about it yeah, so what is what is the french retaliation then because of course they can't you know collectively punish the entire city of algiers exactly so what happens is that first of course you have uh, you know poli- you know the police try to take care of it but when it simply goes too far when you know there's not you know, when when it simply can't be stopped the the uh, the general the governor general of uh, Algeria, Lacoste, calls, calls upon the help of French paratroopers under General Jacques Masseur of the 10th Parachute Division. His entry and the entry of the paratroopers turns it into the Battle of Algiers. Now, the, the battle isn't exactly a battle in, in the conventional mean. It's more pick point attacks, occasional bursts of submachine gun, bombs, assassinations, uh, and the, the paratroopers uh, doing, you know, roundups, finding suspects, torturing them, 
which which was to become the enduring image of the Battle of Algiers, torturing them, and through them getting information of on on this cell, and then you know how to eliminate this cell and that cell until they reached Yasef Sadi himself, uh, who was captured alive actually. The the battle itself ended in October on October seventh, nineteen fifty seven, when. Saudi's right-hand man and perhaps the deadliest operative of the FLN, Ali Amar, a.k.a. Ali Lapointe, was cornered in a safe house in the Kasbah, uh, which was then blown up. So, I mean, at this point, do, do the French then declare victory, I guess you could say? Yes. The FLN was completely annihilated. It was left with no, almost like no power because of all of his operatives being killed off or captured. But in a way... It's it's it comes to it comes down to that saying, you know, uh, you know, win the battle, lose the war. Yeah, because I mean, it seems like the the French at this point can kind of congratulate themselves on a job well done and pack up and go home, having eliminated this resistance. But clearly, not all resistance was eliminated. And more importantly, the widespread use of torture, which which reached French media, which through letters sent by French soldiers through men who some themselves experienced it coming out and talking about it in 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 uh, metropolitan france it brought a huge storm of protest against what was happening because we have to imagine we have to think about the the rationality the rationale that these soldiers thought about when they tortured they thought that we're not going to lose we will not lose this is not into china we have to win there's no way there's no way that we will lose Algeria the same way we're losing to China. That that meant that they had to do everything. And that meant that they had to essentially do things that really no one would be proud of. And that many people in metropolitan in metropolitan France compared to what the Nazis did in during you know to, uh, to you know against the French resistance. Yeah, and was torture? I mean, was this something that was uh, occurring? just by this, you know, choice of the soldiers themselves, or was this kind of official policy of this is how you get information from a captured uh, FLN member? It wasn't done uh, officially. I'm not going to say that, but I can't say that. I, I mean, I'm not going to say that there's a, there was a doctrine that said, oh, you know, to, you know, use the use of torture is going to help you. No, but it, it, many had, many had experiences from Indochina where torture had been used. And, uh, but in Algeria, it was far more widespread and, uh, of course, we have to remember that the soldiers themselves were more more radicalized by what happened in, in Indochina. But it is, it is also worth to remember that the settlers who played a huge role in this conflict, because they were almost like the third part in this conflict, they were the third part in the conflict, they looked upon the paratroopers, the French Foreign Legion, the, the elite troops, as their saviors. The paratroopers were immensely popular after the Battle of Algiers. The, the, they were the heroes of the European settlers. Just to give you an example, uh, the, the battle ended in October 7th, like I mentioned. And as, and as it moved towards Christmas in Algiers, the toy shops began to be filled with toy submachine guns, children-sized paratrooper uniforms, uh, and and red berets, you know, just like the French paratroopers. Children wanted to be the paratroopers. They wanted to dress up like the the heroes, like like children today dress up as uh, superheroes, you know. With this tremendous popularity of the paratroopers, at least amongst the 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 French settlers in Algeria, but it seems like there's there's also uh, the, the the feeling back in in kind of uh, mainland France, I guess you could say, that maybe this was not a clean victory. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. Um, there's a there, there's a quote that says that you know the war was was almost. I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna paraphrase, but it's it was a shitty war, a war of shit, because that 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 comes from actually from a from a from military source that actually says that. <laughs> but this popularity also made it worse for the for the conscript because they were sort of the second rate troops you know no one cared about them they were freezing in some uh, base you know sort of in a position uh, as far away from the city as possible you know oh it was just the it, it was the paratroopers the french foreign legion they got all the glory we are sitting here freezing our asses off 
Yeah, so, but with the with the FLN forces really kind of militarily broken, uh, what is what is their next step? What? How do they regroup? They regroup by focusing on perhaps the most important part, the lines of communications and supply lines in Tunisia and Morocco. Now, Tunisia, in the Tunisian border, there was a long line that was begun being constructed in 1957, a, a line called the Maurice Line, uh, which was uh, more than 200 miles. It stretched from the Mediterranean to the Sahara, it was manned by around eight, 80, 80, 80,000 men, and it was made out of mines, barbed wire, and perhaps more important of all, an electric fence, which was charged with 5,000 volts. This is to prevent the FLN training in Tunisia with all those supplies from crossing the border. And the line was incredibly effective. The FLN threw almost everything they had at it. They were trying to overwhelm the French. They were trying to find weak spots. But, like I mentioned, mines, electric, electrified fence. You had mobile units, French units, quickly moving to, uh, to wherever a breach happened. That the FLN failed spectacularly and suffered tremendous losses. Essentially marking the, the beginning of the end of F of the FLN as a as a as a milit as a guerrilla army essentially. Yeah. So I mean, it, it seems like they've they've lost in the Battle of Algiers. There's this massive line cutting them off from supplies and training in Tunisia. When when did they get a break? Oh, they don't. But the, the thing is that they do get a break because the French make more mistakes than they do good things. You know, they they constantly make mistakes and but we 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 have to see that this these mistakes are made by men generals legionnaires paratroopers professional soldiers who are once once more radicalized these are men who are not thinking straight they will do anything to gain victory i'm just going to use an example using the the morris line as an example the army knew that, you know, the Morris line was just not simply enough. You had to take the fight to the insurgents on the other side of the border, which was neutral. So what happened was that the French bombed the Tunisian village of Sidi Youssef Sakiet, ending in 70 civilians killed, leading to a rift in Tunisian-French relations and if I may quote Alistair Horn, Sakiet was a revealing example of, a, of how, increasingly, the French army had become accustomed to acting without the backing of civil authority from Algiers, let alone Paris. Essentially, the French army was acting on its own accord, doing things that damaged political and diplomatic relations internationally. Were there attempts to then rein in the, the, the military in Algiers then? The French government had such a weak or rather fragile grasp that it would all come together on May 1958. That's the climax, I, I would say, of the tension between the French government and the French army. So the, the French had this very weak uh, government then? Is that, I mean, is that what you're saying? Yes. I mean, the, 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 the Fourth Republic, because we're on the Fourth French Republic here, they, they went through different... Uh, Crisis. There was constantly French government crises all the time, a ministerial crisis and stuff like governments had fallen. By 1958, early spring 1958, uh, uh, Pierre Flimflam uh, opens direct negotiations with the FLN for a ceasefire. For the first time, a French minister opens direct negotiations with the FLN. The European settlers in Algeria are taken back, wondering, how could you do this? How could you even think about negotiating with terrorists who have, you know, raped, murdered, and tortured? Th to them, it was completely... They, they, they thought that they were going to be abandoned. The settlers were going to be abandoned, and the FLN are going to take the power. Perhaps, luckily, for the settlers, I mean, if you could even call it luck, the French army thought the same thing. 
So it all came together on May 13, 1958. What had begun as a ceremony to pay homage to three French soldiers that had been executed by the FL FLN later turned into a demonstration, or rather a mass meeting of French settlers by the monument Armodes. The hardline settler, with the quotation marks, leadership had whipped them up to a frenzy, and when uh, uh, Gen General Raoul Salan arrived at the scene, uh, uh, General Raoul Salan was the commander in chief at this time, the settlers sh started shouting, uh, put the army in power. And when the ceremony was over, there was little actually to stop the settlers from taking over the French government in Algeria. Things happened pretty quickly from here. The army was thrust into power and they adopted it willingly. The leadership demanded Charles de Gaulle to take power in France and they expected him to be the sort of person to not uh, want to give up Algeria. Yeah, so I mean, I, I know the the idea of you know De Gaulle as this as this hero, of course, but you know why why De Gaulle in particular at that point? You know why was he the one being put forth aside from? I mean, was it just this this military background from World War Two? I think it's 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 fair to say that Charles De Gaulle towers over French modern history, literally, because he was a very tall man. Uh, he. He was he was a man who was seen as resolute, you know. You know the war too. You, most people are familiar with Charles de Gaulle being, you know, the leader of the free of the free French, and many of the generals, you know, were you know part were in Algeria had fought under de Gaulle. They saw him as the strong man that this nation needed, to sort of to help them out of this crisis, just like he had done during World War Two. Uh, now the first really an only time that they go, you know, had publicly spoken about the Algerian war was in a press, co press conference in July, July 1955. You know, the Gaulle's own vision of Algeria was that it, it couldn't rule itself and had to enter into a sort of French federation that, you know, in which they could be guided and closely cooperated with, with, with France. It seemed like when they were putting him forward, like, as you were saying, they, they expected him to kind of continue this hard line against Algeria. Absolutely, absolutely, and uh, and uh, it should be noted that, interestingly enough, that he had no previous knowledge or actual involvement in the 1958 coup. There was there was no there was no involvement, and uh, and uh, one of the generals, General Yak Masu, famous from uh, the Battle of Algiers, he pleaded to the Gaul to break his silence because the Gaul at this time was uh, was retired, living on the countryside. To break his silence and to form a government which was supposed to save Algeria, but this failed to materialize quickly. So the French, the, these the generals, they were they were they began to draw up plans. They were threatening France, the French government, that if things did not start moving faster, they'd take care of it themselves. Essentially, they were threatening civil war in France, that they would do a military invention in France in, in an operation that was uh, called Operation Resurrection. Anyone who listens to this might think, oh, you know, it's just empty words, you know, they were just being tough guys, you know, they're, you know, big legionnaires and paratroopers, tough guys who, who you know, wouldn't, wouldn't really go through it, but they were, plans were done up for it. Corsica was invaded on May 24th. And there was a present, a very present fear in Paris of an intervention because of it. You know, people were, you know, people are quoted as being uh, as uh, constantly looking up in the sky, like they would see, you know, falling parachutes. Yeah, yeah, because I mean, it seems at this point, you know, a large bulk of France's military is over in Algeria. Precisely, there are, of course, a NATO presence which uh, prevented even larger amount of troops to to come to Algeria. But the presence is serious enough because, I mean, you have the elite of the elite. You got the French Foreign Legion. You have the paratroopers. You know, you have soldiers who are experienced in battle and who are now so radicalized that they want to overthrow the government. De Gaulle went, th went through the French news bureau, a AFP, and he went through then with an affirmative that he was prepared to take power. And he went into negotiations with, the, with, the, with Paris. And 
he finally agreed to form a government in on May 30th. And with Charles de Gaulle in power, he essentially demanded di dictatorial powers for a limited time and then went on to put forward a new constitution. This constitution in turn was then put down to the ballots and it led to an almost overwhelming yes in favor of a new constitution. 79.25% voted yes, leading to the fourth republic, republic dying in Algeria. Yeah, so what were the key key aspects of this fifth republic then? I mean, you know, pres because presumably it was geared in no small way in kind of uh, addressing some of the weaknesses of the fourth republic. Well, exactly. It was it was more about having this. Like I said, it, he had more like emergency powers essentially. He uh, Charles de Gaulle, of course, spoke of, of course about a, an Algeria that couldn't rule itself, and that, that he wanted to keep Algeria French. That's what he initially said, and peop and the, the the you know the the revolting generals, everything, they were happy. They said, "Okay, let's get back to business," and they did. Militarily, uh, the death knell of the FLN in, in, in military matters. I mean, the, the FLN did not, you know, they, they were not completely eradicated, but they were very closely eradicated uh, during what, what was known as uh, the Chal Offensive. Uh, General Chal was to go from Raoul Salan, and his offensive was finally, finally coordinated. He said, Neither the Jebel, the, the mountain, nor the knight will be able to harbor the insurgents. So he, you know, had the commandos de chasse, you know, French and uh, Muslim units uh, tracking down insurgents. He had the mobile, the, you know, the, the paratroopers, the French Foreign Legion constantly on the tail of the insurgents. And he also coordinated the um, quadrillage, the sector troops to coordinate, uh, you know, and to to move together and to actually do to work during the night as well, so that all of these the second troops, the the first line troops, all of them work together for one cause, and it had a tremendous effect. Yeah, so it sounds like the the military in Algeria with the installation of de Gaulle is really getting everything they wanted. They do, but this also meant an increase in, you guessed it, reprisals. It means more violence towards civilians. It means more torture. It means more more villages burning. It means that more people are turning on France because, like I said, the 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 the, the SIS, the civic action, was was perfect. That was a great idea. You know, give give them something so they 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 would think that okay, we're actually losing something if the front the French isn't here. But then you know the paratroopers come in, the the French Four Legion, the even the second troops sometimes, you know, they commit massacres, executions, they burn down villages. It doesn't go well. And at the same time, I, th I should, I should note it, I should uh, mention this, resettlement, you know, the deportation becomes more aggressive. But with that, FLN infrastructure, you know, the, the taxation, the tax minister, they are all eliminated. So, you know, it's, it's sort of like there's not a, the, the French military don't know how to balance things out. Yeah, so I mean, it seems like the the main kind of uh, force for independence, the FLN, at least the the main organized body, has been largely eliminated. But at the same time, the general population itself is becoming um, more resistant in general to French, uh, basically being part of France. Exactly, and it's it's almost. I mean, uh, you know, if you if you're a if you're a student of counterinsurgency like I am, it's almost a pity to see the. The, the efforts of the SIS go to waste because they do do they do a lot of good things and logical things things that I would recommend like okay this is how you do things right and uh, that I mean it they, it's worth to commend them on that but at the same time you it has to coordinate everything has to be coordinated into one particular strategy you can't have a strategy of hearts and mind at the same time as you have one of reprisals and executions. Yeah, so so what changes then? I mean, wh where is the breaking point then? Because, of course, Algeria is, of course, now an independent nation. So, uh, you know, what, what finally draws this, this war to a conclusion? It is, ironically, de Gaulle. <laughs> that is something that becomes the big disappointment and almost betrayal. Charles de Gaulle is concerned with France's international status. 
he wants to see France become great again. But great in the post-war world is not through colonies. And the people, the people of France, you know, are turning against the war because of torture, because of everything it has heard so far. And the European settlers themselves, they're really cocky about themselves, confident. You know, they're, they're like, yeah, you're not going to leave. We have, you know, political power. The, the war had had been allowed to tear France apart. A referendum was held in 1961 in which 75% of the voters uh, voted in favor of Algerian self-determination and that sort of started uh, moving the goal towards negotiation. Now he personally believed that Algeria would choose to enter a union with France instead of you know absolute independence and his choice to start negotiating was clearly seen as a betrayal by the French forces in Algeria, which had put him into power in the first place. Yeah, so, so the, yeah, these were groups yeah. that had been planning a, a coup to put him, you know, held a coup to put him into power. To, I mean, was there plans to hold another coup to throw him out? Yes, and they did. In 1961, another coup happened in 1961. And this was uh, amongst the men who, who did this was the Raoul Salam. It was uh, Chal. And he... We have to understand, once again, the mindset that I'm going to keep keep repeating because I would like to make people understand just the sort of mindset these people were in. They, first of all, thought that this was a communist conspiracy, uh, that people, that Algeria had to remain fr French, that the, uh, they, they were not to be betrayed by the politicians and the civilians at home, and that they had to essentially restore the greatness of French military power. They staged another coup in 1961, and Chao, one of the, the ringleaders, of course, was the general, he, he, to quote him, he said, for example, uh, do you want that Mesel Kabir in Algeria tomorrow shall become Soviet bases? Evidence, that is just evidence of just how far these men were from understanding their enemy and what they actually wanted. They thought they, they were just communist goons, essentially, that they had no agenda of their own. Is this coup successful, though? No, because de Gaulle brilliantly outmaneuvered them by appealing to not only the general population, but, but to French conscripts and re reservists who make up the majority of the soldiers, who are clearly not radicalized or thinking in, along the same lines. And... If the generals and the and the officers are not, you know, can't have that support from the from the majority of the French army, it sort of fails on itself. And what happens is that the generals, you know, they see that okay, we can't do anything more. They either surrender or they when they go underground. Uh, for example, General Chal was just mentioned, who was the mastermind between the Chal offensive, was sentenced to fifteen years in prison. Uh, Raoul Salan. Uh, who went underground, for example, was was sentenced to death and actually escaped to Spain. But at the same time, something else happens. The, the third part, which I have spoken very little about so far because we're focused on the, the, the French government and their forces and the Algerians and their forces, they enter with the OAS. The Organisation uh, Armée Secrète, the, the Secret Army. And these were hardline settlers, uh, officers, uh, French officers, all the sort of people who did not want France to leave Algeria. They essentially created their own insurgent group, their own terrorist group, and started doing bombings. They even attempted to assassinate Charles de Gaulle in Paris. I mean, and this is all in advance of the referendum, correct? Uh, yes, absolutely. This is an advance into the second referendum because uh, the Evian Accords, which is the, the big uh, negotiation with the FLN, comes to an end in 1962. A second referendum for Algerian independence is, um, is put forward and uh, it is won with 91% who have voted for the Accords. Algeria becomes independent. 
Yeah, and what's the reaction then of this? I mean, of of I guess in part the generals, but also of these these hardline settlers which have formed their own secret army. The the secret army keeps it keeps fighting, it keeps fighting, it keeps fighting in France, it keeps fighting in in Algeria, uh, targeting uh, everyone because it, it's like a, it's like a three way battle because you have the OAS, the French army, the French army gets targeted by the OAS. But also the FL- FLN gets targeted by the OAS. So it's it's sort of like a three-way battle going on there. But by Algerian independence, we get a mass exodus from Algeria by by European settlers. They they all starting to leave. Uh, and this also I- involved large mass reprisals uh, by the FLN uh, against uh, Muslims, uh, indigenous soldiers who had fought uh, as auxiliaries or with the commander shahs they were also hunted down and killed. So, so we have basically, you know, Algeria has its independence. We have uh, the mass exodus of, of um, uh, essentially French Europeans out of Algeria and, and the establishment of this, this Algerian, you know, state. But you know, th- this war is also seen as kind of instructive in a lot of ways, and it, particularly in how to conduct or really how not to conduct a counterinsurgency operation. So... You know, if you could just kind of start to bring us towards a, you know, kind of a conclusion here and kind of an epilogue to this, you know, what is the legacy of the Algerian war then? We have um, two legacies uh, in, in terms of in, when, I'm, when I speak about counterinsurgency, it has two legacies. Uh, the first legacy is that of uh, David Galula, who I'm sure anyone who is maybe have served in the United States Armed Forces or maybe is currently serving, know that he is uh, his the uh, the current um, manual if, if you may of, of counterinsurgency in the u.s army is actually based on some of his works and mo- more importantly his work uh, is titled counterinsurgency war from 1964 um and i'm, I'm gonna i'm gonna briefly speak about uh the the his work because i am personally very critical of david galula his work has been widely lauded in in modern day for perhaps the wrong reasons. Uh, when, when he wrote the book, uh, guerrilla warfare, or rather counterinsurgency, was becoming a trend. John F. Kennedy, for example, had rec- recognized the, the fact that socioeconomic factors went into fighting against guerrilla warfare and that he himself supported the study of counterinsurgency and the use of special forces, the Green Beret, and so on. And David Galula was in the United States. He wrote this book in 1964, it was probably 1964, called Country Insurgency to Warfare. The content of the book, I, I'm, I'm just going to be honest here, there's nothing really new to it. I mean, it is essentially based on on the, what I mentioned before, the, the Revolutionary Warfare book that came out of French uh, into China. But what he did, however, which is really important, is that one, he wrote it in English. Two, he wrote it in a way that was easily accessible for all students in, in, in military matters. And Galula was actually, I'm gonna I'm gonna compare the Galula to a like a like a popular historian to a popular like one of those popular science writers. That's sort of the level he was at. Because what he did was nothing groundbreaking. What he did, he just compiled things that other people had uh, had done. Even though he had experience from counterinsurgency, but he there was nothing really groundbreaking. And one might think that. It, it wouldn't exactly be that suitable to base uh, base any sort of um, lesson on counterinsurgency by, by by someone who was involved in a war that was incredibly brutal. What's the second legacy of the of the Algerian war then? The second legacy, and I've actually waited to say this because I could have said this much more earlier, and I'm sure there are some uh, people individuals who are really mil- interested in, in military matters who are just like shouting at me to say this probably has been doing it for the last two hours the biggest innovation of the war in my opinion air mobile tactics that is the use of helicopters in 1954 there was one helicopter in algeria by 1960 there was 400 of course this was never the scale of the vietnam war which you know you know the 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 Huey became the the one of the the most iconic images of that war, but the air mobile tactics used in counterinsurgency used this in this way in this way uh, to lift troops to strategic locations to providing fire support, 
to you know using essentially take essentially use air mobility to move elite troops from one side to another to flank them to you know do everything because you know the the train was very suitable for this stuff and but it was still i mean to the modern day viewer it was still very primitive but it was still something that was very unique something that hadn't quite been used in the same way before to the, the first combat use of the helicopter, uh, that is putting soldiers into battle with the helicopter, was actually not, that did not actually take place during the Algerian War, it actually took place uh, during the Suez Crisis in 1956. But uh, the Algerian War phase changed how helicopters were used in terms of counterinsurgency and how they could be used, you know, for air mobile tactics. Excellent. Well, Stefan, thank you very much for talking with us on the Ask Historians podcast. Oh, thank you very much. It has been a pleasure. And it has been a pleasure having you listen as well. Thank you, as always, for listening to the Ask Historians podcast. I hope, in retrospect, it makes sense why we had that early diversion in the first episode into the French Indochina War to kind of set the stage for what happened in Algeria. Because we could see, as it came up again and again, the idea that uh, Algeria is not Indochina, that it was not a dispensable part, that it was not something that could be let go, that it was something that was worth spending years and many lives and displacing uh, you know, two million out of the seven million people in Algeria as part of collective reprisals, that it was just a, a simply a very brutal, brutal war. But also how it you can see the the onset of this fear of you know the red you know global red scare of communism coming in you know the the quote by the general about uh, Algeria becoming a Soviet satellite state uh, it was just you know it's one of those things that set the stage for so many of the decades in the post World War II uh, period uh, that it was it was interesting to see how it played out both in Indochina but also in Algeria as well. So I hope you enjoyed the podcast. If you have any questions, uh, feel free to come by the Ask Historian subreddit. We put up a discussion post on each one of these. And until then, feel free to rate and review us on iTunes, whatever streaming service you use. Uh, we're available on, on a number of services. If not, let me know and I'll try to get us up on there. Uh, we have a SoundCloud page where we put up the last two episodes, or the last three if if our uh, if you know, space of, of is available. Uh, we're slowly adding uh, past episodes to YouTube, so you can catch us on there as well. So I hope you enjoyed it uh, in two weeks. We will be coming out with a, another two-part episode. This time, we will be interviewing Calabreth, our very first uh, interviewee on this podcast. He'll be returning to talk about the Roman military, to continue our, our war theme, apparently. So, we'll see you in two weeks. Until then, enjoy. And for those American listeners out there, please enjoy your own successful counterinsurgency. You've been listening to the Ask Historians podcast. For more history like this, visit us at reddit.com slash r slash askhistorians and ask over a hundred historians and enthusiasts anything you want to know in history. Find us on Twitter as at Ask Historians, and subscribe to the show on iTunes. Or visit askhistorians.libsyn.com. Thank you very much for listening, and join us next time on the Ask Historians podcast.